What does it mean to be a warrior? To defend those who cannot defend themselves? To fight for a cause until your very last breath? Today we're going to be talking about Nefeli Lu, a warrior born of pain and suffering. We first encounter Nefeli inside Stormvale Castle. I am Nefeli Lu, tarnished and warrior like you. I'm here by decree of my father. We discovered that in fact it is Gideon who is the father that Nefeli spoke of. I understand you've been speaking to Nefeli. She's my daughter. I took her in when she lost the guidance of grace. Based on the use of took her in, Gideon isn't Nephili's biological father. He took her under his wing as an adoptive father. He promised Nephili that if he were the one to become Elden Lord, he wouldn't allow the weak to be oppressed again. And for this, Nephili swore unquestioning loyalty to him, vying for him to become Elden Lord. But as some of you know, Gideon isn't all that he appears to be. We next encounter Nephili at the entrance to the village of the Albinorix. This is not a happy place. Hundreds of Albinoric people hanging, bodies piled high and any survivors can be heard wailing in pain. There has been a massacre here, innocents slaughtered without reason. Nephili mourns them, triggering a memory in her when she was young. I witnessed a sight much the same in my infancy. The oppression of the weak. Murder and pillage unchecked. A waking nightmare made by men. It is saddening that Nephili is not unfamiliar with this kind of brutality, but her heart has not become cold to it. She vows to avenge these Albanurics, to track down the one responsible and make them pay. Justice to the oppressors. Let the scars I carve remind them. I am Nefeli Lu, warrior. When we return to the round table hold, we realize that sadly, she will not have to look very far. She sits alone, underground, and will not speak to us. She has clearly learned of the perpetrator's identity. Her own father, Gideon. You've already heard. Indeed. It seemed the whelp harbored suspicions, so I had no further use for her. Honestly, what's a man to do? Without a second thought, Gideon disowns her. This is the man who Nephili trusted, the one who took her in in her time of need. He promised to fulfill everything her heart yearned for, but it was all a lie. She was just a tool, a pawn in Gideon's plan. Because we accidentally foiled his scheme by defeating that omen killer at the village of the Albinurix, and as a result, Gideon callously casts Nephili aside, drops her like an object that has long surpassed its use. And the worst part of all is that Nephili, instead of being outrightly furious with Gideon, she questions if what she did was the right thing. Father, rather. Lord Gideon has offered me guidance all my life. I would have done anything for him, to place him on the throne of Elden Lord. And yet I, though it was not my intent, I betrayed him. Her head begins to swim with feelings of self-doubt, abandonment, blame. All the while her heart screams back that this is wrong, scarred from the deep wound of witnessing the same injustice years and years ago. To think he'd order his men to enact such tragedy. Where is the justice he purports in that? He once told me that if he became Elden Lord, he would never allow the downtrodden to be cheated ever again. Was he simply lying to me? It's difficult to sit back and watch Nephili struggle with this, as she continues to call Gideon her father. It's important to understand why Gideon did this in the first place. So Gideon was the one who ordered the village to be razed to the ground because he was searching for a medallion, or rather, one half of it that an Albanuric was guarding. And because we and Nephili stepped in, the search was cut short. So what is so special about this item? Well, the reason why there are two halves is because when they combine, it will allow access to a secret area, Mikola's Halig Tree. This area was kept a secret because it was created to be a safe haven for the Albanuric people. 
and in order to keep it safe, the Albanurex made accessing it difficult by splitting the key into two pieces. The reason why Gideon's men couldn't find that half of the medallion in the village is because the one bearing it cleverly disguised themselves as an unassuming pot. I am Alvas and Albinorek. As you can see, we're finished. The whole village is finished. The curse mongers have destroyed everything. No one that remains has their wits about them. As if the Albinorex haven't had a hard enough time, they are also cursed with a short lifespan. So Albus, seeing that we are not like those other savages, entrusts us with his half of the medallion and tells us where we can find the other half. Then he sadly passes away. Now something that I didn't mention yet is that after you receive the medallion and return to the round table hold, something quite sinister will happen. The area looks off, but before we have a chance to realise exactly why, a nasty surprise comes rushing at us from around the corner. Ensha, Gideon's personal guard, runs at us, glowing a familiar red colour, just like an invader. He strikes first, and we have no choice but to fight back. After doing so, we can question Gideon as to what prompted this sudden ambush. Ensha got rather ahead of himself, it seems, as his master. I'd like to express my regret, but now, Ensha is slain and gone, finished, forevermore. It's a strange reaction, no remorse, and no explanation as to what exactly Ensha was getting ahead of. This event will trigger as long as you have received this half of the medallion, which begs the question, did Gideon order Ensha to take us out because he knows that we possess the medallion he's been seeking? Gideon does not have access to the Halleck Tree area, which we later learn is filled with information about Mikula and Melania. Consequently, there is a large gap in his library of knowledge. The reason Gideon wants to unlock the route to the Halleck Tree is because, like his name suggests, he wants to know all. But what really throws me off is when Gideon says, Ah yes, by way of apology. Allow me to tender some advice in regard to the half of the secret medallion you possess. How does Gideon know that we possess one half of the medallion? We just arrived at the round table hold, we barely had any time to exchange two words before being ambushed, let alone recount our tales of the Albanoric village. Unless Gideon had other ways of finding out. Let me be clear when I say that Gideon is called the all-knowing, but he's not omniscient. A more accurate description would be Gideon the Eternal Student. He relies on gathering new information to document the history, the characteristics, the weaknesses of gods, demigods and shard bearers. Which brings me back to my point, how did Gideon know we had retrieved half of the medallion? Well this might be due to the mention of someone called the All Hearing. When you speak to a particular crone, she gives us a cryptic hint. The all hearing slaughtered, but alas, it was for naught. But all you need do is snatch it from the big pot. The big pot might refer to Albus, and the all hearing one could be a reference to two potential candidates. Firstly, we have Ensha. It would kind of make sense that Gideon the All-Knowing would have a counterpart called Ensha the All-Hearing. It would also explain why Ensha immediately attacked us once we had returned from the village. He either has the ability to overhear conversations, like the one we had with Albus, or, just like how the title of All-Knowing is a half-truth, all hearing could be a way of describing that Ensha has his sources, other people to do the listening for him. However, this theory mostly consists of pure speculation, there isn't too much hard evidence. However, this brings me to our second candidate, Gideon himself. All hearing could be another nickname for him, in addition to the all knowing. This can be confirmed by one piece of physical evidence. Gideon's armour, a set with countless eyes and ears. The symbology speaks for itself, but not necessarily the functionality. These body parts are decorative, they can't actually hear. 
can they? This is where I want to mention an incredible theory by these two Redditors, who linked the symbols of Gideon's armour to a very small similar detail on the scarabs. These marks look like eyes and ears, and we find these scarabs patrolling around the lands between. So could it be that this is some form of surveillance system for Gideon, and the places where there are no scarabs are blind spots in his knowledge? The post goes into a lot more detail, so I'd recommend you give it a read. This theory also reminds me of Bao Huang's power from One Piece, being able to see everything that the Marys can see. For all intents and purposes, the scarabs are like a CCTV system. It's sinister to think that someone could be watching your every move, recording your every action, or in real life, everything that you do online. That's where I'm happy to reintroduce our champion and sponsor for this video, NordVPN. NordVPN can help protect you from malware. Say you get an email from someone who looks like your friend. They tell you to check out a picture they've attached. You click to download the image and now your device is infected. Your data is stolen, destroyed or even ransomed. But with NordVPN, you can protect yourself against malware like this with their threat protection. It scans these incoming files for you and warns you of any danger. If you use my code MISSCHALICE, you'll not only get a huge discount when you purchase a two-year plan, but you'll also get one month absolutely free. And for a limited time only, you can help celebrate NordVPN's 11th birthday. With your purchase, you will also receive a mystery gift, which is additional subscription time. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Please consider using my code if you want to get this exclusive NordVPN deal. Thank you again, NordVPN, and now let's return back to the video. So, to summarise, perhaps it was Gideon who knew that we had acquired the medallion and sent Ensha to ambush us, and then when we approached him, he lied and passed all the blame onto Ensha. Now we've discussed Gideon's methods and motive, let us return back to Nefeli. She will be stuck ruminating over this betrayal, unable to break free from the mess in her head. But we have the opportunity to remind her of who she is, what she has come from. To do this, you need an item called the Stormhawk King. When Nefeli sees it, a memory sparks within her. Is that ash? I can smell the ancient storm in it. My thanks. I'll gladly take it. It reminds me of my first hawk. Thank you. The reason why this is so significant to Nephili is that the use of the word first indicates that this was a tradition from her birthplace. But this is no ordinary hawk that we've given her now. These are the ashes of a hawk revered by all others as sovereign back in the days when Stormvale's winds still raged like no other. Sovereign meaning these are the ashes of a king. Which king we will get into later but it is a powerful enough symbol to reinvigorate Nefeli with her usual strong warrior spirit. We will next find her back in Stormvale, in the throne room, with the happy news that she did indeed follow her heart and stick to her morals. I told father I would be with him no longer. I remembered the vow I took when I first became a warrior, so many moons ago. This land is much like the one from which I hail. Nefeli gathered the courage to leave the Round Table Hold, and by extension, leave Gideon. It's interesting that she still calls him father, despite everything he did to hurt her, but it just goes to show that Nefeli is an incredibly good-natured individual. She doesn't badmouth Gideon, she simply focuses on moving on, remembering why she became a warrior in the first place. And interestingly, this was also due to the help of another person, called Kenneth Height. Kenneth is a nobleman who needs your help reclaiming his fort, which has been overrun. However, when we complete his quest, he tells us that he is seeking someone more fitting to be the ruler. Uh, I suppose you must have seen it by now, yes. The sorry state of my fort. Oh, indeed, it is a foul fate for a land to be without a ruler. The state of the lands between is much more cutthroat and dangerous for someone like him to rise to a position of power alone. But a true and stalwart lord of the proper lineage to take the reins of Limgrave. Someone who has the proper lineage, and that person is Nefeli. But why her? 
Not that I'm complaining, Nephili has many ideal characteristics of a great leader. She's caring, honest, and steadfast in her beliefs. But how exactly does she possess the birthright? This is all to do with her name, her last name, Lou. And you may be familiar with another character who shares this same last name, Hora Lou, also known as Godfrey. It is thought that Nephili is related to Hora Lou in some way, perhaps not directly like a daughter, but maybe some form of descendant. So how do we know this? Well, Hora Lou's story originates from somewhere called the Badlands, and we find this out from the armor set you get if you choose the hero starting class. Following the example of their chieftain Hora Lou, the brave warriors of the Badlands shun excess adornment. Although Nephili refers to herself as a warrior, which is a whole other starting class, she most definitely wears the armour of those from the Badlands. She has repeatedly mentioned that she is not from this area, which would imply that she grew up elsewhere, in a land where Horalu was the leader. Let's take a few steps back and talk about why Horalu is calling himself Godfrey and vice versa. To begin, there was Godfrey, Marika's first husband. He did her bidding. He led the war against the giants, faced the Storm Lord alone, and then there came a moment when his last worthy enemy fell, and it was then, as the story is told, that the hue of Lord Godfrey's eyes faded. This is the moment where Godfrey lost the guidance of grace. That could be what the last line is referring to by the light fading, and as such, he was exiled from the lands between. This was all part of Marika's plans. Melina tells us Marika's words. Return to the lands between. Wage war. And brandish the Elden Ring. Grow strong in the face of death. Warriors of my lord. Lord Godfrey. Marika wanted Godfrey to leave, become stronger, and then she would call him and every other Tarnish back and Godfrey was the first one to ever be classified as a Tarnished. So Godfrey travelled far, far away, but he didn't go alone. He took with him his kinfolk and left the lands between. After the long march of the Tarnished came to an end, Godfrey divested himself of kingship, becoming a simple warrior once more. This is where Horalu was born, the chieftain of the Badlands, as we hear in the game's cinematic introduction. Godfrey returned to his roots, embracing his savage warrior past. Interestingly, his weapon, Axe of Godfrey, was broken in a battle fought as leader of the Tarnish during the Long March. This weapon is symbolic of Godfrey's vow to conduct himself as a lord. This axe is also a symbol, a gift given at the start of his reign, but now it is broken when he was cast out. The symbology of it breaking, or perhaps Godfrey breaking it himself, removes any ties to his lordship and the status and the decorum alongside it. It probably came as some relief. Whilst Godfrey was serving as lord and Marika's husband, he had to repress his insatiable need to spill blood. When he vowed to become a lord, he took the beast regent Sarosh upon his back, to suppress the ceaseless lust for battle that raged within. This explains why, when we fight Godfrey at his phase 2 turning point, he reverts to his Horalu identity, and when doing so, he destroys Serosh, doing this not only to remove Serosh as a limiter to his power, but the savagery associated with it, tearing this loyal animal to pieces, showering himself with its blood. This is who Godfrey really is. Now I fight as Horror Lou. Warrior! These words and the way they are said are exactly the same as Nephili. They are definitely connected, sharing the same background of the Badlands, the same path as a warrior, and both possess a claim to rule the lands between. This is why Kenneth deems Nephili suitable to be the next leader of Limgrave. He sees her as having Godfrey's bloodline. Now how directly they are related is up for debate, like I said. It's my personal opinion that they are not part of a nuclear family, because the two of them have no interaction or dialogue with each other. 
Especially as when you complete Nephili's quest and go to fight Godfrey, she is an optional spirit summon. But she doesn't say anything before, during or after the fight. There is no acknowledgement of their relationship, which seems like a missed opportunity if they were indeed father and daughter. Now as to why you can summon Nephili here is where we return to that mention of the Stormhall King. Earlier when we gave Nephili the ashes, it opened up a lot of questions. What exactly is a Stormhawk? Why do we not see any of these birds around? Well, we can actually see Stormhawks, or rather what's left of them. In Stormvale Castle, the birds here are technically classed as Warhawks, but that was after they were brutally maimed. These were originally Stormhawks, but their talons had been sliced off so that razor-fine swords could be grafted in their place. As soon as we hear the word grafting, we know that this is the handiwork of Godric. These beautiful birds were not spared from his twisted experimentations, cutting off their talons and replacing them with blades to manufacture them into savage killing machines for his bidding. It also might explain a connection between Nephili and the Stormhawks because we meet her at Stormvale Castle for the first time. This grafting of Godric's ill befits a lord. He's tainted the very winds. If you intend to challenge Godric, I ask you call upon me. But what were they like in their prime majesty? There are other Stormhawk ashes of a hawk called Dean. Then we learn that they were a fierce hawk that faithfully rendered lifelong service to the old king of Stormvale long ago when the true storm raged. This sentence reveals a lot. Firstly, it paints us a picture of how the lands used to be. On the map we have Stormvale Castle, preceded by an area called Stormhill. And based on Dean's ash description, we can assume that the winds used to be spectacular here. So strong they would embolden the abilities of the Stormhawks, allowing them to shred through their foes. But what else we learn is that they faithfully rendered lifelong service to the old king. Could this king be the Stormhawk king? If so, then they were the previous ruler of Stormvale. But what happened to end this rule? Well, as it turns out, the king may have had a connection to Godfrey. Specifically, it was mentioned that Godfrey fought someone called the Storm Lord, but the Storm Lord was defeated. When we talk about spirit ashes and their place in the universe, we also refer to them as spirits. They are those who have died in some manner, which explains why we now have the Stormhawk ashes. But this also might explain why Nephili wants to fight Godfrey. Nephili has a strong affinity with storms and Stormhawks. Her weapon of choice is a Stormhawk Axe, which is a signature weapon of warriors who strive to remain one with the storm, despite being so far from their place of birth. And Nephili's last words to us are, I will call upon the storm to drive away the foulness that has settled on the winds. So it's clear that Nephili's allegiance lies with the Stormhawks and harnessing the storm. So if Godfrey did indeed kill the Stormhawk King, and Nephili knows this, it would explain why she's willing to fight Godfrey as a form of revenge. And that is where the quest ends. I've seen rumours that there was more to this quest, but Nephili's content was cut. And as for this data being restored, I'm yet to find any evidence as to what this quest might have contained, so if you do know, please leave me a comment. There still remains a few points left to summarise and discuss. Firstly, was the Stormhawk King actually a hawk, or was it just a metaphor? The reason for this question is that we are presuming that he was the old king of Stormvale mentioned in Dean's Ashes, but that would mean a clan of birds living and ruling in the castle, which is not impossible as there are stranger things to exist in the lands between, but it does seem strange. Rather, instead of the Stormhawk King being the ruler of Stormvale, Perhaps he was the king of the Hawks, whilst there was another figure who ruled as Stormvale's king. The Stormhawks pledged their loyalty to this unknown figure, as mentioned when they faithfully rendered lifelong service. Now, the Stormhawk King's ashes do say that he didn't answer anyone's summons, so this was most likely some sort of allegiance that they formed, a mutually beneficial relationship. Which leads me into my second point. 
If the Stormhall King doesn't answer to anyone, then how come when we give his ashes to Nephili, some sort of reaction happens? Although we don't see Nephili use the summon, it's implied that she might have control to do so. And this is because Nephili is special. If Nephili is the descendant of Godfrey, and Godfrey defeated the Stormlord, assuming this is the same being as the Stormhall King, perhaps our bird monarch recognises this when Nephili touches the ashes. She is of the same blood as the man who defeated him, and now she will become ruler as Kenneth has decreed. In his spirit form, the Stormhall King acknowledges this and allows Nephili to harness the power. Perhaps he senses her good nature. This is in a similar fashion to when Godfrey became a lord. He was bestowed with Sarosh, a beast companion, and now Nephili will become a ruler with the Stormhall King at her side. I also want to mention the name Lu, which is the primary basis we are using to connect Nephili and Godfrey or Hora together. If Lu is indeed considered a last name, it is noteworthy because there are no other characters who have a last name, aside from Gideon Ofnir and Kenneth Height. I've seen people discuss if Lu is instead a title, a rank, rather than a surname that has been passed down. However, I would be inclined to disagree. I think it was intentionally included so we could make the connection. I think this makes much more sense with Kenneth's mission to find someone of proper lineage. But please, contribute your own opinions, discussion is always welcome on my channel. And that is the end to Nephili's side of the story. I know that I also covered Gideon and Godfrey because it's impossible not to talk about them, but I might consider doing uh, an individual video for Godfrey and Gideon just so they have their own time in the spotlight as well. A really big thank you for everyone who's watching this video and the influx of people who recently subscribed to my channel. I'm just really, really happy that you enjoy watching my content. Uh, and I'm especially grateful for your patience as law play videos like this can take a little bit longer to create. Um, I made this Nephili one completely from scratch. Uh, I would have liked to have done her pauldron as well, but I was conscious of time. But yeah, I really love doing this and it means the world that you like it as well. So thank you everyone and as always a special mention here for my channel members. Razors 5, Jawbite, Kyle Coldwell, Grim. Hellborn Hero, Rotoya Blom, Exile Turtle, Bloodfallen 223, Jeremy, Monkaru, Kichu, Joe Africano, Nubist, Chase, Just Nick, Kevin H, Teganon Dowell, Tabris, Jonathan Viras, Tarnished Ozzy, Frankie Felix, Milo Raglan, Cheatma, Daunted 232, Jeremy Horatius, Dark Souls Weeb, Grizzlify, Echo Sandwich, Joachim Westman, Bucky, Liver22, Trip Kennedy, STK True, Punish Nickname, Meskir, Lower 420HZ, Karcharadon Zastra, Yogsathof, Kundri123, Delanator90, Vinicius Alajo Lego. Thank you everyone so much.